Hi, and welcome back to my video series on a theory of consciousness. As you recall, my basic motivation is to present an outline or a scheme that illustrates how the neurons of the brain can produce something like a first-person self. I wanted to present a general architecture that would reside somewhat midway in the explanatory chasm that currently exists between the domains of neurology and technology on one side and first-person mental experience on the other. My contention is that if we're ever to succeed in modeling consciousness or simulating machine consciousness, we need a general scheme that accommodates not only the neural nature of brains, but also some of our basic, common, first-person mental behaviors. In the last video, I presented and described the major contributing elements of my scheme. These consisted of primrons, duprons, patrons, and abrons and we basically showed how memories are created. In this video, I want to further demonstrate how the scheme works and how it provides a theory of consciousness. To do this, we're going to consider one of the two common first-person thought processes that I mentioned in the first video. As you recall, I said that in order for any theory of consciousness to be appealing, it needs to be able to explain our first-person realities. The first one I described was automatic memory stimulation where we encounter some object in the external environment and have it automatically stimulate an internal image of a similar object. The example we used was of walking down a busy city street and seeing somebody who looked familiar. So let's start by imagining that over time our organism has encountered a large number of objects. Consequently, we see a large number of abrons as well as underlying patrons. We'll assume there's a unique abron for each unique object encountered. Let's see what happens when it encounters a new object, A. To make it simple, we'll assume that A is identical to some previously encountered object, Q. As it engages object A, we see the corresponding primrons becoming active. And since the full attention of our conscious organism is being directed to it, these primrons become hyperstimulated by the central activating system. This causes the corresponding connected downstream duprons to become stimulated. The third rule of this scheme is that if a patron ensembles a number of duprons and a certain threshold of these duprons become stimulated, the entire patron will become stimulated. In this case, all of the visual duprons for patron Q1 have been stimulated by object A, and consequently, so has the entire patron Q1. From a first-person perspective, this would be equivalent to having a vague notion of familiarity with the way this object looks. Continuing, we'll assume the same thing happens with the tactile primrons and duprons, and that there's a pre-existing patron Q2 already established from some previous encounter. By reapplying rule 3 from before, abron Q has also become stimulated because patrons Q1 and Q2 are stimulated. From a first-person perspective, this would be equivalent to a vague feeling of familiarity with object A. It would seem inarticulably familiar, but we wouldn't yet be able to place our finger on why. Continuing, our organism's attention is now fully directed to the smell of object A, causing the appropriate primron and dupron to become stimulated, further stimulating abron Q. At this time, the organism's attention is drawn away from the external object and inward to the stimulated abron. It then hyperstimulates it, which corresponds to the conscious acknowledgement that this object was actually encountered before. I'd now like to talk a little bit about the CAS, or Central Activating System. You might wonder why it needs to hyperstimulate primrons and abrons before we actually are aware of them. The reason is peripheral consciousness. In our normal, everyday, first-person lives, we can only be fully aware of a very limited number of things at any one time. For example, we may be intently focused on trying to read and understand a user manual for something we're desperately trying to fix. And as we're reading and trying to understand the manual, we're basically unaware of other phenomena that are occurring in our environment. There may be a humming sound coming from some nearby appliance, or there may be a faint odor in the room. If someone were to stop and interrupt you and ask, by the way, do you hear that humming sound? You'd momentarily redirect your attention from the manual and consciously listen. As you focused on the sounds in the room, you might also hear some other sounds that you weren't paying attention to but eventually your hearing system will lock on to the humming sound and you'll reply to your interrupter that yes, you do hear it. There's a lot of this type of peripheral activity that we're basically unaware of or not really paying attention to. 
It's accurate to say that in the previous example, the sensing cells in your ears were actually resonating and responding to the various frequencies of the humming. And it's likely that the corresponding downstream primrons were also in a pre-stimulated low-level state. However, the activity was never consciously acknowledged. So in essence, there's a lot of activity that we could be consciously aware of, but are only peripherally or pre-consciously aware of. It isn't until our attention is fully directed towards it, even momentarily, that it then becomes instantiated into our memories. That is, if you hadn't been interrupted and never consciously noted the humming sound, you'd have no remembrance of the humming sound. Remembrance or memory creation only happens by virtue of conscious attention. It doesn't happen unless we consciously note a sensation or a set of sensations. And that's why the CAS needs to hyperstimulate. It corresponds with our first person act of consciously paying attention to some sensation, which automatically initiates a memory. Sad to say, that's all we have time for in this video. In the next video, I'll address the second first person mental phenomena that this theory or scheme explains. That is, our ability to compare or verify a remembered object against an object in front of us. I'm also going to fill in some additional pertinent details and caveats. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video.